to start with. Um, I've basically been the monetization and business guy for a bunch of browser games and mobile games in the last around about 15 years. And through that time, I've developed what you could call a personal mission to help especially small and medium-sized developers take that business perspective into account when making the game so that the games that come out of the development process are more scalable. In order to achieve that today, I'd like to share a story about a game we published in 2016 called Nonstop Night, some of its biggest flaws, even though it was rather successful overall. Um, and what we have learned out of it, what you can do to not fall into the same traps if you are developing a game. Um, so mid of 2016, uh, the story of Nonstop Night begins. We were rather successful thanks to Apple and Google immediately with a big featuring, uh, got something like two and a half million players in the first week. However, this game also had at its core a pretty big design flaw. Um, and as mentioned, small and medium developers um, who we work with quite closely um, do pitch us a bunch of games and we have recognized the same flaw in many of those. So I'd like to tell the story of this problem in Nonstop Night and how you can avoid it. It starts with um, a pretty famous guy who just by coincidence started playing this game and was extremely passionate about it. It's an electronic music um, uh, a producer and DJ called Dead Mouse. If you have not seen him, um, he has this iconic, weird mouse variant of a mask. Um, and he's also famously into video games. So if you look into him on social media, you will find pictures like this one, which is one of his cars, a McLaren um, video game themed. So pretty well off, pretty strongly into video games, pretty obsessive in Nonstop Night. He even uh, went so far that he reached out to us, asked us for the character rig, and then he hand animated this thing and used it in a couple of his shows. Like here in the Hammerstein in New York, pretty amazing passion, um, also total geek. Now, this guy is pretty well off and really passionate, and these kind of players in mid-core free-to-play games, like RPGs, like Monstop Night, are known to spend 30, 40, 50K or more over their lifetime. GDPR time, so I won't say what he exactly spent, but let's say it's much, much, much less. And if you have played Nonstop Night, you know why, because there's just not so much stuff that you can buy in this game. But the reality is if a person with so much passion and so much money doesn't spend all that much, then the average revenue per paying user is much, much smaller. And that is a commercial problem for the game. Now, if you haven't played Nonstop Night, a quick run through, what's the game? Procedurally generated dungeons, it looks like an RPG, so you slay hordes of monsters, you go deeper and deeper, you collect items and loot and get more powerful. That allows you to go even deeper, slay boss monsters. But if you hit a floor where it's too hard, where you don't have enough power anymore, you basically use an uh, incremental game trope, which is ascending back to floor one. You lose all your gear, but you get permanent character upgrades, you're more powerful, and next run you can go deeper. But after three, four, five times players really realize that you just go deeper in order to go deeper next time. Or in other words, the game doesn't really have any content to aspire to. And so it's very likely not surprising to you to hear that in terms of statistics, there were really good engagement values in the first week because the game is accessible and fun, but that dropped off really quickly. Daily playtime halves between day one and day seven. And this is the revenue curve when we launched the game. It's not bad, but way too flat for a game that is supposed to be live operated over a longer period of time. Around about 70% of total monetization happens within the first seven days. Now, through live operations, we've been able to expand that to a certain extent. So the first couple of months, we've added systems and different content types. And that was reasonably successful, as you can see in the data. But it became harder and harder to find content that really mattered to the audience. And at some point, we hit a glass ceiling way too early for the life operations cycle that you would expect from a so-called mid-core game. The reality is that Nonstop Night was just designed with too much of the developer mantra of avoiding the content treadmill. A game where you loop through the same content all over again is really good if you are a very small developer and you want to bring a game fast to market, but it's not made for expansion of content and for ongoing live operations. As I mentioned earlier, this is a somewhat common problem. We see a lot of pitches, and it's uh, quite misaligned if a pitch has 
very little progression content, but the developer at the same time aims at a multi-year life operations case with the, with the message basically being um, having a game that players can play for years, building a community. Really, that is not going to happen. Without content, there will not be a community. Players want content that keeps the mechanics fresh, that they can aspire to, and also that they can talk about with their in-game friends. And so I strongly believe that it's a very early decision for developers to make. Do you want a short-term game and then move on to the next one? Or, and now I'm saying that inconvenient word yet again, do you get on the content treadmill? Are you ready to sustain a game? Now, what have, have we learned and what are three practical perspectives to take in mind? The most important starting point is really to set yourself a specific and realistic target. Life operations is very much like a marathon run. And so the biggest impact or the biggest success factor lies in the preparation and the readiness as well as in the mindset. Just saying that I want a game that you can play for years is the equivalent to saying I want to run for a while. And that obviously won't necessarily make you ready for uh, completing a marathon. So set yourself a specific target. For mid-core games, a benchmark can be 50,000 euro monetization depth. Sounds a lot, um, but in an RPG strategy game, that's a competitive value for uh, top spenders to invest into progression content. On the one hand, that gives competitiveness, because if you limit the monetization depth, then basically your revenue per paying user and your lifetime value um, will be lower than in other games, which means that the amount of marketing that can be done profitably is less. And on the other hand, you can use monetization depth as a proxy for content depth. If top spenders can invest that amount of money, then you also have enough content, you have the scalability in systems that allows you to entertain other players, other payers for years. Unfortunately, there's good, a good bit of cynicism in the market, especially monetization design types talk quite a lot about how whales have to be hunted and how you can kind of squeeze the last bug out of players. And I think that's not only an uncool analogy, it's also plain wrong. Games are not long-term successful by exploiting players. I would rather, if the whale analogy has to be used, see it as giving those potential top spenders what they really want. In the market, rich individuals spend for their hobby, basically, for free-to-play games, sometimes way more than others want or can. Um, and these people inevitably will show up, like Dead Mouse, in your game. If you don't give them enough content depth, enough monetization depth, they will run away. They will find their satisfaction somewhere else. And just to reiterate, even more importantly, monetization depth means content depth. And content depth keeps players happy. A discussion we have very often in this context is, do I really have to care about my monetization depth if I already have a really good pay conversion? Of practical experience, yes. Nonstop Night had a pay conversion of 10% when we left the soft launch. So after a good bit of dialing in, that's pretty good. However, monetization, uh, sorry, um, pay conversion is a game of diminishing returns. So you can only convert so many players in a game. Whereas keeping those payers over a long period of time, serving them additional content that is relevant, is a much more over time scalable type of approach. So it starts with a specific target and with a mindset to actually build a game that has the potential to be run for years, not only with a nice little wish. Um, and it continues with making scalable design choices. I'd like to look at four different angles in design from core gameplay to selling content smartly. Um, starting with the core gameplay, not only because that's normally the first thing that as a developer you figure out or prototype, um, but it's also the strong foundation that a scalable content system needs. Without core gameplay, there is no content desire. So we already, we already <clears throat> established that Nonstop Night was not a very scalable uh, content architecture. Let's look at the core gameplay specifically and uh, talk about why that was the case and what we could have done differently. Nonstop Night is an adventure you can play on the go at your own pace. It's perfect for quick play sessions and when you stop playing, the night continues to earn a ton of coins. It's stress-free 
simple, but with all the key features of an action RPG. So basically, a beautiful marketing pitch, but it looks like an RPG, it doesn't really have the depth of an RPG. You only have a single character who also automatically runs, who automatically attacks. You have some manual interactions with spells that you can trigger, but those are auto-aimed. And the secondary properties that make RPGs really complex are very limited in impact. So crit chance, evasion chance, those kind of things are very uh, low impact. That has constrained us in the ability to expand the content system. So for example, we looked at could we have multiple heroes that run at the same time? It's pretty much meaningless. We had multiple approaches, um, but heroes that run around and then you trigger spells for all of them mean that you don't really have interesting tactical choices. There's very little interaction. And so we hit this glass ceiling that I described earlier. If you go on the complete other side of the spectrum, there are games like Summoner's War um, that have a lot of complexity and a lot of variability in the core gameplay. So in this game specifically, you have turn-based combat and you have multiple heroes, multiple opponents, and a strong interaction between <coughs> these hero monsters, not heroes in this game. Um, so active and passive skills that these monsters have will very strongly uh, depend and impact on what kind of opponent team you're fighting against. Um, their secondary properties, like for example, the elements-based rock, paper, scissors system is extremely impactful and you have manual targeting abilities. So the amount of, the degree of player control is much higher than for example, in a game called Nonstop Night. Uh, with all these variables in the core gameplay, it really makes a difference for you as a player if you get a single new monster type, um, you can basically suddenly win dungeons that you were not able to win before just by shaking up your roster and by having these interactions between skills. And so really early decisions during prototyping when you figure out the core gameplay are determining what the scalability and the ability to extend content are. You can look at things like, for example, the number of units that are active, the degree of player control and how much power is derived from stats versus skill. A uh, thing I like to discuss with developers is that prototyping should actually not stop when you found the fun, but rather when you're convinced that extending the content, adding new content, can sustain the fun over time. Another side of the basically same coin is readability. And there's a beautiful example that all of us will have played with Clash Royale, um, which is, I would say, plain genius in terms of readability, camera angle, UI, and particularly the action on the battlefield. Every single unit is so intuitive that you can kind of guess or have a feel for what it does. The giant is a tank, the skeleton army looks like a counter for a tank. Um, they, on top of that, through their symmetrical gameplay, can highlight content that you don't yet have. If you see a card that you have not gotten yourself play against you, there's an immediate content desire. Let's look at a very similar game that worked way, way worse um, maybe the fastest follower to Clash Royale in the kind of PvP light MOBA uh, genre was Star Wars Force Arena. Uh, in spite of the Star Wars brand, way less successful, and in part due to the bad core gameplay readability. They chose a very realistic art style, quite high degree of detail, and that makes it confusing. You don't really know if these stormtroopers or what the role of these specific stormtroopers are. And they also chose to zoom in more on the action. You don't see the whole battlefield. And so yes, it might look nicer on a screenshot or a gameplay video, but it's really much less useful. It doesn't um, allow the player to read the action and the content all that well. And basically, if as a player you can't read and understand what content does, then your desire will be very limited. Um, if players, so the questions that you can ask yourself is basically, if players get new content, do they see and feel that they are more powerful? And do they see and feel how different heroes or weapons or items behave. To repeat, content desire really doesn't come from what you offer in the meta game, but from how useful that content is in the core gameplay. The second component in design that I'd like to highlight is how um, over time usefulness changes quite a bit. So stress testing how player power, for example, scales is a big deal. Um, Ask yourself questions during the design process. How would player power be affected by a new item if I already have 300 items and not only 10? And particularly if you want to have a gacha system, simulate gacha roles um, throughout the whole progression of a game 
and see if the perceived player value out of the gacha is still relevant after 30 days, after 90 days and longer of gameplay experience. Many curves look like this when you start out because basically you get all kind of old content that is not that powerful, not that relevant anymore that stretches out, out the gacha, uh, gacha boxes and that obviously is rather unattractive for players. If you want to keep content relevant over time, a couple of techniques that are used um, by games in the market are, for example, events that you can only enter with old um, or with, with lower tier kind of uh, content. Racing games do this quite a lot, so you have to take specific card types or specific card tiers. Specifically, card games and also Clash Royale are really, really good at through core gameplay parameters enforcing variability. So you can't just go and take all the most powerful and newest attack cards in your deck because then the deck would be too slow, of course. And other methods include, for example, gameplay modes where you have persistent health across a roster of heroes or units and then you are incentivized to level up all of those units over time. So let's assume you have a really robust design that can scale over time. You're convinced that your core gameplay drives content desire. Let's talk about selling content a little bit. And I would have chosen the Marvel games because those are doing a fantastic job at highlighting and integrating new game content. It's also kind of unfair because they have these pretty big movie tie-ins multiple times per year. And so let's rather look at a game that has to come up with their content themselves. Yet again, Clash Royale provides somewhat of a masterclass. They have actually evolved quite a bit over time. The way they do it these days is by announcing content with beautiful assets in-game and social media to, to kind of tease what's coming up, to make game content relevant immediately with tournament systems um, that, where you can experience and even win the new content. And then if you still haven't either gotten the new items or the new units, um, or if you want more of them, they sell the bundles. And that has pretty immediate and visible revenue impact in addition to the buzz and the engagement it creates with users. So these bumps here in a three-week time period are direct incremental revenue impact. And if you compare this to when Clash Royale still released units somewhat one-off and not through such an elaborate rollout procedure, this is substantially better and more impactful. We obviously have to talk, if we talk about selling, also about loot boxes. And loot boxes are particularly tempting if you want to talk, if you kind of want to create infinite monetization depth. It looks as if you have the potential for infinite rewards or infinite roles, but really what matters is player value. Player value is most easily expressed as power. Let's take a racing game. Players want to be faster. Faster cars make them faster. And so they desire most a faster car. Um, we as game makers, on the other hand, can't produce all the fast cars, so we kind of have to stretch the content uh, to make it last for a while. So we take those fast cars, bundle them up with a bunch of tuning parts with other things like soft currency, and put them in a gacha um, as a random bundle. Now, gacha balancing is a pretty big topic, um, and I'd only like to talk about one basic principle today, which is that the gacha is only as desirable and only as deep as the most desirable content. It's relatively simple. If players don't want that fast car because it's not much faster, not really unique compared to the content they already have, then basically the gacha is dead. And if there are no more new cars because your content pipeline doesn't support it, the gacha is dead. Nobody plays a lottery like a gacha is for a constellation price. The gacha is only as deep as your most desirable content. All right, we have a clear goal in mind and a specific target. We design for scalability. Now let's be real about production constraints and that's last but definitely not least because basically whatever game you want to make has to fit your abilities as a team, not only to ship it but to sustain it over time. If Life operations is visualized, or the best way to visualize life operations is truly as a marathon. So choices about art style. Do you want 3D or 2D? What kind of um, level of detail and character art do you want to have? Uh, what kind of environment art? And also content architecture. How deep should your game be? Um, really affect your 
ability to provide great live operations. You remember how in Summoner's War, um, new heroes, new monsters are basically the one thing players desire? They also have a fusion evolution system where to get the highest tier of monsters, you need 360 two-star monsters and fuse them all together. Well, that is a good system if your arc team looks like this and if you can churn out thousand monsters and if you can provide regular content. It's not a good idea to be inspired by this specific game if you have a pipeline where each individual monster takes two months to make end-to-end. -end. Unfortunately, that is a real example. I won't say the name but we have experienced this with a developer and it breaks my heart when a beautiful game can't be sustained because it's inspired by the wrong game, because it tries to be too much. Constraining yourself is better. Don't try to be such a team. I firmly believe that a beautiful game without content pipeline will be less successful than a game that has its unique styles, maybe not production value heavy, but has consistency in relevant content over a long period of time. And so, if we accept that players really want meaningful content, then we as game makers and we as game publishers should also like meaningful content. And I believe that this picture of the content treadmill is actually a bad picture. It sounds so abhorrent. Um, and obviously, churning out meaningful, uh, meaningless content would feel rather bad. But if you make the right decisions foundationally, if you have a content, that, a content architecture that can scale over time, then your community will actually grow. Players will appreciate what you release and your business case will work out. And then the better picture is for ongoing content production, maybe a jog on the beach. That's it. Thank you very much. Um, if you'd like to get feedback on monetization, retention, that kind of stuff, drop me an email. You were saying that... Um uh, if the company is not that big, not that large, they would should they should consider another types of creating the content. Yeah, so it would wouldn't take for two months and so on. So maybe you have any like tips for smaller uh, guys? What should they uh, like focus on? Well, it's basically simplifying. Summoners War has this giant pyramid of content, and players need a lot of monsters. Um, otherwise, it feels dull. Um, just don't take inspiration from a game that is so different in the content pipeline that supports it. Um, and I said, games don't have to be 3D. Games don't have to have fancy animations for every single character and the environment. It's much more important that it's fun and that the fun can be sustained over time. Uh, so obviously, uh, Nonstop Night was a really successful game. Uh, so the question is, would you do that differently? So don't you think that by doing it differently and having in the end like a game much more similar to uh, Summoner's Wars or whatever other game, uh, Nonstop Night would have lost its uniqueness, its uh, immediacy in the gameplay and all this kind of stuff. So would you do it differently? Or do you think that these kind of games like uh, getting new players, uh, converting them early on, and then losing them is still like a viable business model for, for uh, uh, even an RPG-like yeah. game. Um, so the question was, um, what we do Nonstop Night vastly differently and what we lose out on the unique <coughs> success factors there. Um, we would do it differently, and there are two dimensions to it. The first and maybe most simple one is, we would go in with the expectation that this game is not going to be a big and long live operations case and the team would adjust accordingly, would move on. Totally viable business model if you know it. But if the expectation is we want this game and build the community for years, then Nonstop Night and similar games are the wrong content architecture. The second angle is it's not only complexity in one core gameplay mode, but you could, for example, experiment with multiple different gameplay modes where then the simplicity maybe is the adventure mode, and you might have different uh, game modes with a little more player control, which we might or might not be working on. So hi, I'm Yossi from Zaibatsu. So your talk focused on monetization, but all I see as a developer is talking about retention. So how often do you see games where the uh, first day retention is not that high, but the monetization like saves the whole product? Like is there such a case? Um, the question was, uh, how often do we see games that have longevity and monetization and first day retention or early retention is not that high, but that are still successful? 
the, these cases exist quite a lot. Um, the 4X games, Game of War type of games are all of them these kind of cases. Um, that is relatively rare, and especially in small and medium type of developer uh, circles, that's relatively rare. So early day retention is really important, but more important is engagement. What I said about Nonstop Night was not only the monetization values, but also that daily playtime halves within the first seven days. That's a warning sign. So monetization depth is one thing, but take it as a, take it as a proxy for how relevant is content over time. Meaningful player goals, fresh mechanics, um, and then on top of that, you have the ability to monetize people who have a lot of money and who are willing to invest a lot of money in your game. I got a question. So you've, you've done Nonstop Night, you've also done the Chuck Norris game. Yes. There's a question that people have is, when you've, you've done it, the same kind of game with a different skin, when is it too much? And how long, is, and how long of a wait should you have if you're going to be kind of doing these kind of reskinning of games. Mm. So the target audiences between those two games, Nonstop Night and Nonstop Chuck Norris, were so different that we didn't really see any cannibalization. We tested that quite extensively, didn't have any worries about it. However, the reskinning of a game impacts gameplay performance quite a lot. Um, to give you specific numbers, the marketing traffic performance in the US for Nonstop Night is with a, for example, day, th day seven retention, 35%. Nonstop Chuck Norris doesn't reach 20. Same game, same amount of testing optimization, different audience. Um, we believe that in principle, audience comes first. So player fiction and theme has a gigantic fundamental impact on what kind of game will work with this audience. Would you continue to do these kind of games as well? And if so, when would be a good next response? release date? Would it be a year later, two years later? Um, that really depends on the case a little bit. So we do look at reskinning or differently themed variants of a similar gameplay. Um, we would be much more careful with non-gaming brands. It was cool to work with Chuck Norris. A lot of good anecdotes about him arm wrestling with our guys. Great marketing case, not a great game performance. Okay, cool. Justin, thanks Thank a lot.